Greetings, one and all. Welcome to Champions of Purposeful Change. Today, we have Nicole Rocchio from Google, who's the Global News Consumer Insights Lead. And Nicole will take us through a fascinating career uh, coming up through uh, the GE Healthcare Commercial Leadership Program and then into various roles at Google, where now she leads a very uh, progressive uh, team helping uh, publishers and other news organizations uh, navigate uh, Google offerings as well as connect meaningfully with readership. And Nicole will tell you all about it. Enjoy Nicole Rocchio. And we are so excited to have Nicole Rocchio from Google with us, though she is a proud product of the Philadelphia area, as am I. And uh, you've had a ton of time on the road. We've had a devil of a time scheduling this, but thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you so much, Bill. I'm so excited. I have had quite the schedule, and so I'm really excited to to chat today. We're going to have a great yeah, time. We are, and we're so happy to have you. And before we get to Google, which is endlessly fascinating, it's a little company someone may have heard of. Uh, sure. Let's let, let's talk about, about the backstory and kind of what has led you here. I mean, growing up in the Philadelphia area, as noted, Penn State undergrad, GE along the way. Give us the, the hop, skip, and a jump through Nicole's uh, story that leads up to Google. Yes, would love to. Um, I should probably say go Eagles, right? Since yes, go birds. So. <laughs> go birds. Um, so yes, I grew up outside of Philadelphia and I started my journey. Um, I guess we can start with our college journey at, at Penn sure. State. And so while I was at Penn State, I worked within the, or my major was in human development and family studies in yep. the health and human development um, college. So I, I did that as well as some psychology. And then I did a lot of research in my undergrad. Um, and my research was kind of within the family dynamics, infant development area. Mm -hmm. um, and so then we fast forward senior year, I have to find a job. And yep. I think that while I was considering all of these different areas, potentially going back to school, et cetera, I decided to head to the career fair. Um, shout out to Penn State because they have a fantastic career fair. Excellent. And I uh, I stumbled upon the General Electric Healthcare booth. And so obviously this kind of you know drew me in because of their healthcare. And there was this program there that I was really interested in. It was called the Commercial Leadership Program. And when I decided to interview with them, it was quite the interviewing process, a bit rigorous. Uh, and I ended up landing a job with the program and I started that. So that was kind of like my college into my first role. Mm -hmm. I think what was really interesting with that first role, what it was exactly was this two year development program. So I mm -hmm. moved every six months to a new city right. for two and a half years, which was absolutely wild, taught me a lot of things. Um, and within this program, essentially what you would do is shadow different parts of the business, all with execs within General Electric. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that that really kickstarted my journey through the corporate world. I was able to really learn so much in such a short period of time because I essentially was able to just watch execs and the way that they handled themselves in all different facets of the business, which was sure. the coolest thing ever. Mm -hmm. And so you, I think you told me you did San Francisco, you did Milwaukee, you had oh, a yes. new, new, new cities, different functions, all kinds of stuff there. Yes, exactly. So I essentially started in Boston. Um, so there's a class of us, there's 15 per year and we all get different cities except for one of our phases. So the first phase I started in Boston, that was by far the coolest phase because I had the opportunity to not only meet the CEO of GE Healthcare, but also the CEO of GE mm -hmm. and um, have a chance to chat with them, better understand their vision. Very cool. We moved on to Milwaukee <laughs> and that is where the headquarters of GE Healthcare in the United States right. exists. And that's when I got to be together with my entire class. And so all 15 of us were there learning about more about like the marketing areas of the business or like the behind the scenes, um, inside sales, et cetera. And sure. then I moved on to Philadelphia. I was very lucky to get selected for that area. Yeah, yeah. very, very fun. And then my, last but not least, it was San Francisco. And then I was essentially in, in New York for um, kind of like what I would be rolling off the program into my full-time role as before I made the pivot to, uh, to join Google. Mm-hmm. 
and so at what point um, was it in your undergrad? Was it through some of these GE exposures that that insights became, you know, you had, as you mentioned, a psychology interest. Uh, at what point did insights sort of crop up as a potential direction for you? That's a great question. I believe when I was in college, I mentioned slightly that I did some research while I was in college. Yeah. There is an underpinning of data across my entire story that I, I don't think ever really went away. I found out in college that when you are learning concepts or especially learning from human behavior, being able to look at the data and the insights from specific studies over years of time, et cetera, really, really do lead you to better understand exactly what you're looking at. And so I am a massive, massive data nerd. Right, <laughs> and right. the insights that you can pull from that that's what I think actually will tell the story. Like that's what you build your story around. And so I always find that it is what you could consider more of like a North star or a guiding light to figuring out what your next step is, but also understanding the crux of the problem or the issue to then find a more viable solution. And this can be applied across any industry, but I would say that my research background in college kicked it off. And as I was moving through all of those different phases within the GE program, there, there were so many reasons to need to have very specific tangible insights to certain things that we were learning just so that we could honestly move forward or yep. figure out what our next step would be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so you're about six years in, you went from GE to Google. Uh, tell us about that transition and uh, kind of what attracted you to Google initially and then can't wait to, to talk about what is a really cool role and a cool team that you currently occupy. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I'm about, yeah, you're right. It's about to be six years. It'll be six years in a couple in a couple months here, Google. Um, I, while I was in San Francisco, I learned so much more about the tech world outside of the corporate business world. When you look at the healthcare system, I think that there are a lot a lot of parts within the healthcare system that could use the help of technology in one way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. And while I was in San Francisco, I was exposed so much more to learning about new and up-and-coming tech. And there was a part of my brain that thought, okay, the corporate world is so important. I really have a good grasp, I would say, on the learnings of the beginning of the business side. I do think that it's so important this day and age to have a really good understanding of tech as well. And so I was yeah. like, okay, I think it's time to just make a pivot. Let's head over mm -hmm. to Google, check it out, <laughs> see what's yeah. going on. And then maybe the two can be like, you know, married in the, in the next role or something that I would go into at least, you know, that was my original plan. Yeah, it makes sense. And so you are the global insights product lead for this news initiative at Google Whereas Correct. many of our previous guests here have really been focused on kind of internal constituencies and providing insights to for, for decision support across things like innovation and marketing, et cetera. You work, it sounds like, with external constituencies primarily. Could you tell us a little bit about the team you're on and the and and the work that Google does with news organizations? Yes, absolutely. Would love to. Um, I sit on a team called the Google News Initiative. Our team is specifically staffed to help support local journalism, you know, across globally speaking. Yeah. Um, so what we do, and there's a myriad of different teams, of course, in our functions, specifically my team, what we work on is we've developed a tool called News Consumer Insights. And within our tool, we have worked with over thousands of publishers at this point, globally speaking, to better understand audience engagement and reader revenue. So if a publisher is, you know, has a website and they're trying to better engage with their audience, figure out a way to have a very loyal audience, continue building that. And then also figuring out how, of course, to make money on top of that. So we're talking sure. ads, subscriptions, contributions, et cetera. We have a tool essentially that will look at all of your analytics on your site, that will look at the traffic on your site and your page speed, et cetera, all of these different factors. And the really cool part about our tool, which I'm, I'm going to be such a nerd about it because I think it's absolutely fantastic for publishers, is we take, you have all of this data, right? And so you're looking at your analytics data 
data and you're like, okay, but what does this mean? And then you're able to pull from the data an insight. So let's say that there is 70% of users on mobile and 30% on desktop. And then the insight though, is that, you know, the speed on your mobile devices is not ideal. And that's a great insight. And you're like, oh, right. okay, that's fantastic. Like I have something to work with, but then the next step, and that is what I find a lot of people actually do really struggle with is how do I act on that insight to make it mm -hmm. actionable? And so what our tool does is then gives you almost a step-by-step -step of this is exactly how you can improve your page speed on mobile. And so we have like an entire recommendations tab that is personally curated to a publisher. Um, we've done so much research with thousands of publishers to figure out what works best for them, what they're looking for, et cetera. And of course, I'm staffed around a bunch of individuals who are incredibly talented and a lot of them have come from the news industry, whether that be they were a reporter or a journalist in a past life or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. So a potentially a, a dumb but direct question. Why does Google care? Um, obviously, the ability of publishers to inform the public is good for the world. Uh, so there is a, a, a public spirited uh, side to this, I would imagine. But what, why is this a strategic imperative that Google has embraced the way that they have and put you and the team out there to make sure that publishers can continue to optimize the experience for their readers? Yeah. Um, if we take a step back and we're looking at everything that we're doing in the world in general, I will say news is such a fundamental piece to connecting everyone everywhere. Right getting truthful, good news, getting news from every single area. These are things that we know are so incredibly important because we want everyone's voices to be heard. Right. We think about news deserts and, you know, areas that have no journalists and no one reporting on them and how their voices aren't able to be heard. And then we recognize that there are smaller local news publishers whose voices could be heard as long as they have support in one way, shape or form. Sure. And so the reason that we were kind of put together was to give, you know, resources that were at no cost to the news organizations around because making sure that you can get your news, you know, spread out to your community is so crucial to just kind of like the democracy of our entire nation, if that right. makes any sense. No, and it's absolutely. Not like it's hand, but it's just, it's such an, news is kind of the guiding light to everything else. Like that's what's connecting us with everyone and helping us make decisions and keep, keeping us informed. And so, you know, goodness, if we weren't able to keep everyone informed in all of these different areas, I don't know, I feel like that's kind of a crack in the foundation of what we're trying yeah. to build. No, well said. So you mentioned uh, just as an example that you gave us this sort of desktop versus mobile, and I don't expect you to expose things that are proprietary. But um, what are the what are the types of things that that you guys are working on day in and day out? I mean, is it really through this tool and it's sort of quant driven? Uh, what what are kind of some of the sub tools, I guess, that you and your colleagues are able to employ to help these folks uh, optimize that experience? That's a great question. So. To make it a bit more tangible, we connect, let's say, you know, Google Search Console and Google Ad Manager or Google AdSense if you're doing ads related work. And then we're also um, connecting Google Analytics. And so these are all of the different pieces of information that can kind of be plugged into this tool. And the way that we kind of work through it and the reason that it's so um, important at this period in time is because we're launching a brand new version of this tool oh. um, in the next week or so. <laughs> and so you've caught me at quite um, an inflection point. Mm -hmm. But what this tool is doing is we're having publishers, you know, within our beta group testing connect to the tool and then making sure that the way that we're customizing the recommendations to the publishers is properly working. And so, for example, another one of them that is not proprietary, um, and I, I talk about a lot, is newsletter signups hmm. and the way that a newsletter signup widget should look on a publisher's website in order to attract the right attention. And then, of course, what your newsletter should contain and the way that you engage with your readers and, right. you know, taking a look at all of that data to collect the correct insights before making decisions moving forward. 
So this is an end to end capability for I'd imagine some of the publishers you work with and uh, are, are fairly sophisticated on these topics. Others may be less so. Um, is, is it easy for a publisher to become part of this program? How, how does one go about it? Uh, you mentioned it's a no cost service. Mm -hmm. uh, why would anybody not want to? It's, is, is it easy to get yeah. involved? <laughs> I think that <laughs> Google is sometimes has such a large name, it can almost be a disservice in a way sure. because there are so many teams and so many people working on a, a bunch of different things. Um, we, if you were to just Google, <laughs> that's <laughs> a silly statement, if you were to Google <laughs> Google News Initiative, we would have a website page, a landing page with a contact email where you could reach out to us. We also list all of our resources and tools sure. on that website. And so that's the easiest way to get in contact with us. A lot of publishers are also a part of a larger association. Yeah. And then we work with the associations one-to-one -one. and you know they have conferences, it's conference season right now. And so sure. we also are easily able to communicate through the association that you know, is discussing with hundreds of publishers, different topics mm -hmm. here and there. Yeah, excellent. Uh, speaking of conferences, you, uh, we, we connected with you in part because you have been a prolific uh, attendee and contributor. Um, your uh, thought leadership, your perspective has, uh, I think we're all uh, glad, uh, been, been spread across our industry. Uh, what are some of the things that you're excited about as it relates to insights, things that are catching your eye. Obviously, everybody's talking about AI in different contexts, but um, yeah. as you look uh, at the at the sort of near future of the the industry that we share, uh, some things right. that are that are attractive and high potential from your perspective, things that you have your eye on. Yes. Um, well, you said the hot topic, which sure. is any, everything everyone's talking about at the moment, specifically at my company, of course. Yes. AI is hands down the number one thing we're always discussing um currently right now um i've been to a few conferences now already and i'm you know I'll, I'll be going to a few more what what i will say the two i would say major themes for this year are ai and of course the elections that will be coming sure. up yeah, and yeah. you know that's more time sensitive of course the second one but ai is absolutely at the forefront of everything that we're doing there's there's so many things that I could say, but I will keep it short and then we can expand if we want. But mm -hmm. in in the context of AI, specifically within the news industry, I think what we are trying to figure out and focus on is how can AI aid the news industry in a way that does not cause misinformation or right. more harmful things that are kind of put out into the ether. And so we, of course, have teams of people thousands of people working yes. on, on, on different things here. But I think that, you know, we're so excited to work with publishers and figure out the best way to service them in terms of, you know, the way that we're using AI and we have many beta groups and the way that we're working with them is just hoping that we can support them and lift them up. And what is the best way to do that? And so right now that's kind of like the conversation that's happening. And those are the conversations at hand so that we can, you know, collaborate together to like build a future that makes sense for everyone. Sure. And I will well, say it's very top of mind. Yeah, no, I can imagine. So, I mean, you go to various conferences, you, you're on the insights uh, circuit as well as in the, in the news realm, of course, in terms of your clients and the folks who are, you know, focused on the election, which is obviously a, massive news event that is full of, yeah, hot topic uh, that we're all invested in in one way or another, but is, is full to your point of of opportunities and 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 also, uh, you know, things to be worried about, misinformation, et cetera. Um, on the insight side of things, AI is a hot topic too. Um, mm -hmm. And any other things, you know, as you, you, you've become, you know, sort of a leader within your team and what you all do from an insights perspective, AI, as noted, has a, has a role to play certainly in the future of insights, but um, other things that you're maybe hearing about or thinking about, just maybe more insights related that are, you know, just kind of top of mind at this point. We could take this in a in a variety of directions. Um, yeah. Insights in. Yeah. So with insights, I think the most important piece when you're working with external players with your insights is figuring out what insights are actually resonating with those that you're working with and then right, making right. sure you're moving forward on those. And so 
we could talk about specific topics, of course, like, of course, we're thinking about building, you know, loyalty or like figuring out the right insights to get to gather from Google right. Analytics, let's say. Um, I think a lot of the times there's so much to look at that sure. it becomes incredibly overwhelming. And then what I actually find or what I see quite often is because it's so incredibly overwhelming, there is a lot of individuals that will freeze and then we're really not doing anything with the insights that we're gathering. And so if we're right. not doing anything with the insights that are gathering, then like, where are we going? What are we doing? Sure. Um, yeah. And so I think that like, without, I mean, it's quite a broad response, right? Yeah, but of if, course. without getting like too detailed or nitty gritty, I would say that in general, just knowing what to actually do with your data and your insights when you're gathering them is so important, but everything in the terms of who I work with is about how can we build loyalty? Like, how do we build a loyal community? What do we do with these insights? And what are they telling us about our community that maybe we weren't paying attention to before? Because a lot of people will make assumptions based off of their own behavior or actions. And then when you take a look at the data, it's actually telling you something entirely different. Right. Well, I mean, to your point, I would imagine, again, with folks on the publishing side who are varying levels of experience with this, that it is easy to become quickly sort of drowned in data, but but starve for insight. I'd imagine that a fair amount of the time you spend is how do you cut through the sort of signal and the noise to, to really isolate data points that tell them something that could have an impact on what they do? Are there any kind of beyond just being very well aware of that in terms of what you deliver? Are there any sort of strategies that help you help them not get paralyzed and overwhelmed, but 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 to focus on the the, the things that the data is telling them to uh, to prioritize. Yes. So we essentially will work with them in the sense of there are certain programs that you can also join through the Google News Initiative, where it's a bit more hands on in the sense of can we discuss what you're not performing well in? And then let's make a bit of a business plan here and like do some detailing. And there's many different acronyms for types of planning. And <laughs> I'm not going to confuse any of the listeners <laughs> now with all of that. What I will say is that when you put pen to paper and you ask somebody, whoever this is, when you're working on insights, asking them what their top goals are and then asking them to write right. them out. So let's say, for example, I give you, Bill, I'll give you 10 different things. I'll be like, all of these things, Bill, all 10 of them, you're not you're not doing well in any of right. them. I'm <laughs> probably I'm, not doing well in any of them myself, yes. You're not doing well <laughs> in any of them. And so you're like, well, what do I do now? And so what we'll do is we'll help them understand the impact of the 10. Right. We'll say, hey, these are the ones that are high impact. These are, these are the ones that are more low hanging fruit. Between all of those, Let's pick three that you're going to focus on. And then we essentially write what we would say almost like a business plan for those right. three things. Mm -hmm. And then when you have the ability to have someone just write, put pen to paper, it's crazy the things that will happen if somebody yeah. has to write something down or has to like type something out. And so um, I would say that we, of course, could go down the route of like what exactly does all of that entail. But I will say that just choosing a number of those goals that feels digestible to them is mm -hmm. so important. And three is a very special number. I could also talk about that for a while, but <laughs> yes, three is what I recommend to start with mm -hmm. and then building a plan around it. Right. Cool. Cool. I mean, and you've mentioned some of the areas that I imagine are very lively and important topics among publishers, newsletter, sign up, loyalty in general, things like site navigation, mobile versus versus desktop. Everybody probably has a slightly different strategy and approach uh, to these things. And those are fundamental, it would seem, along with a couple of other things to, to getting connecting readers with the content that they'll find value in. Yes, it, you will. You would have no idea when a reader is on a site, the things that you should do almost to make sure that you're engaging them properly and not creating, you know, too much frustration or a bad user experience. So we talk so much about UX yeah. or user experience for those that are listening yep. on a website. And so it's not only around newsletters, but we're talking about, you know, where do you put that newsletter sign up widget? Or if you're going to have something pop up, when do you have something pop up? Or do you have anything pop up at all? Do we have push notifications that we will employ? Do we, how do we do recirculation of your content? 
on your subscription landing page, for example, if a publisher was to ask for a contribution or a subscription from a reader, publishers have on average about eight seconds to convince a reader to subscribe or donate when they mm -hmm. land on that landing page. And so how do we design that landing page to make it incredibly simple, easy to digest, but also enticing enough for somebody to move through the funnel and then purchase a subscription or contribute to that reader. So, or to that publisher. Right. So yeah, um, that on top of like how fast your page is loading and like the data to make sure you understand why your page isn't loading properly or the insights from that to better understand like when users are dropping off or why they're dropping off and you know maybe what content they're dropping off on and should we maybe not produce as much of that content <laughs> right right some other stuff right wow it sounds like a i'm sure it's a rich trove of of um of insights that these folks may not have ever sort of had access to or at least not in as helpful a way um so yeah i mean you you are back in new york uh google uh, you guys have a big big New York presence, but what's talk a little bit of you in mind of, again, nothing that's, that's too proprietary, but about kind of the culture at Google, obviously it's a, you know, to your point, very tech forward organization that is, you know, deeply embedded into the fabric of, uh, of, of our lives, uh, globally. What's it like to be, or what you call Googlers? Is that, is that what the, <laughs> what the term is? What, yeah. what's it like? Tell us a little bit about, you know, the, the life inside. Give you a peek inside. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I actually had originally started out working for Google in Mountain View. And so yeah. that's our main headquarters. And that is a sight to see, I will tell you. I can um, imagine, yeah. Oh my goodness, the campus is massive. It takes almost, you know, like 15 minutes drive to get from one side to the other. Um, and there's, of course, uh, what is that? What is that movie called? The Internship or something that kind of depicts what they <laughs> think Google is like? Yes. So there are some points, of, co of course, that are true and then others that are false but what i will say is when i moved to the new york office we now have i believe four offices here in the city yeah. um kind of the majority is up in chelsea and then we have a new office in st john's terminal google is a fantastic place to work i think that there are always pros and cons sure if you are excited about working at a big corporate company i think that Google might be the best of them. Of course, I'm obviously very yes. biased, but yes. I will say that it's a fantastic company to work for. I think that um, something that's really important is um, being able to have a really good understanding of work-life balance. I think that it's very easy to get burnt out. And yep. I think that at Google, we have a really good understanding of work-life balance here. And of course there are times when you're very, very busy. And then there are other times when, you know, you have more free time, but um, it's nice. We, you know, we are able to, you know, have lunch here and have breakfast here if we need. And, um, you know, coffee is readily available. And so there Helpful. are some fun Google, of course, like, of course, everything is designed nicely and a lot of different areas to collaborate. And everyone that I work with is brilliant and always has something interesting to offer. So I would highly recommend it, of course, but you know, if I couldn't recommend it, then I shouldn't be here. <laughs> yes, so. that is true. At least not, not, yeah. for six, not for six years, which is great. Uh, yeah. in, in, in that spirit, uh, I'd imagine there are many, it is our belief, although we don't have um, all the metrics that we would want, that's still hard in the podcast world, but it is our belief that a certain segment of our audience are folks who have, who are either kind of starting out, coming out of, their ac academic interests and moving their way forward in the world or starting over who are interested sort of in different career mm -hmm. paths. And, and for those who may be, Nicole, have heard about your journey and been inspired by it, any any sort of words of wisdom from the choices you've made along the way or, or sort of values that you've employed in your own career that have become important to who you are as a professional that, that, that someone who's been inspired by hearing from you, uh, you know, might benefit from hearing? Yes. Um... Okay, so there might be there might be two things that I want to mention. One is very broad in general. I think it is so incredibly important throughout the entirety of your career to be as curious as possible. Yeah. Uh, I think that curiosity for me has done wonders 
curiosity can lead you down a multitude of paths. And I think that that's important because what you want to do is figure out what you're curious about and then follow that. Because when you're curious about certain things, then you can better understand what you like or what you enjoy. And being curious, hopefully, will then lead you to be more adaptable, right? So you are better with change and you are looking forward to like better understanding the new thing on the market. I will say that being adaptable and being open to change along with curiosity, to me, that is unstoppable. Whenever I'm working with someone who has this attitude or mindset, I find that they're able to excel in what they're doing and working on because they're open to all of these different possibilities. Um, but yeah, being curious, it sounds so simple. And yet I find that many people really, really struggle with it. And if it's if you're listening and you're struggling with being curious in your role, then maybe this isn't the role for you. Right. And I wouldn't, you know, shy away from pivoting if you need to. Like I've had a lot of people in my life I've seen pivot and do kind of what they would say within their career. Um, what's really, really important is finding somebody who is a mentor to you. Um, and so these are, you know, mentors that you can pick up along the way, but I will say that the most successful leaders that I've seen are curious and the most successful individuals that I've seen have fantastic mentors. Mm -hmm. And so and I, a lot of people will talk about get a mentor, get a mentor, and then they don't necessarily actually say how they get mentors. And so, sure. for example, when I was at GE, I'm still I still talk to a few of my mentors there. Um, we were obviously partnered up because we were a part of a program that, you know, became their mentors. But being as curious about their role and what they're working on as they are then about like what you're working on it's almost like a symbiotic relationship or it can be and just staying connected to that person is so incredibly important if you move to your next team keeping your old manager or old director in the back of your mind and staying in touch with them that's also another way to build mentorship yeah. or asking your manager to, you know, connect you with somebody that they believe is really fantastic in their role or in their job and you could learn more from. So those are the things that I think are truly the most important. They should really try to keep top of mind. No, excellent. Excellent. Certainly has served you well. So, so much fun to hear and learn about what you're doing and what, what Google's doing. And uh, Nicole Rocchio, uh, who is the global news consumer insights product lead uh, at Google. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Yeah, no, I had a fantastic time. Um, it was great chatting. And uh, I hope everyone learned something along the way. Thanks so much, Phil. <laughs> I'm sure they did. Many thanks to Nicole for her time and insight. Really cool things that she's working on. It must be a, a fascinating average week if there is such a thing. Uh, so thanks, Nicole, uh, to you. And to our listeners, thanks to you as well. There's three ways, as always, to support us here at Champions of Purposeful Change. The first is to click subscribe. You will not miss a single episode if you do that. Secondly, you can rate and review. That will help us not only learn from your feedback, but also get noticed by others who might find value in this content. And then thirdly, let's keep a dialogue going about these topics, whether it's future guests, future topics, or just general feedback on how we're doing here. Uh, at Bill Gullen, at Finch Brands on X or through any of our other channels. We'd love to hear from listeners and uh, we're grateful for the time that you spend with us every month. We will sign off from the Cradle of Liberty. <laughs>